Okay, hi everybody. Just let me hit that little blue square with goddess written on it. Um, yeah, this is, I was just saying there in the intro, this is um, around the corner from me. So if you feel like cycling and if you feel like getting fit, it's the wrong place to choose because you get there in five minutes. So that gets you, gives you an idea of um, how far it is for me, i.e. very close. Uh, what I liked about this particular, so you should have the, um, you should have the street view reference uh, in your, in your little repertoire somewhere. There you go. Yes. I just posted Thanks, it to the chat so you can open this up in your, another browser window and follow okay. along. So I've done it in low tide, um, which is probably, certainly used to be my preferred, my preferred, um, my preferred angle or my preferred tidal situation. And what I do nowadays is I tend to go in directly with a brush. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that here because I find that if you, you know, we're talking there about, you know, pressure of time and so on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what's good about this brush first. I'm going to make these rough shapes. And what I love about it is if you make a mistake, you can just wash it out. So wash it away, wash it away. And it's gone. You can wash away. So for example, do, 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 do. Oh, I've made a big mistake. So on goes the water. And so as you can see, you can start again. It gives you great freedom to, 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 to make mistakes. And the reason that's good is that it means that you find your confidence zone much more, much more quickly if you know that you can wash away your mistakes. So I'm sure everybody is familiar with that feeling of oh my goodness, this huge, massive, accusing piece of blank paper. And you're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And so by using a brush first, you can really, really kill that fear of the white page. Already you can see I've made my shapes, I'm making my shapes, and they are um, beginning to sort of make take up the page. Look at this little V shape here. You'll notice that what I'm trying to do always with my reflections especially reflections on a calm day like this is give an exact mirror image, exact mirror reflection of the shape. Um, so it, it's a re another reason why it's really important to do that at the beginning is because once again, you're going to lose, you're going to lose your, your information when the tide changes. So I am a person who works as anybody who knows my work will know, I work uniquely from life. And that means that you have to be super fast. And very often you'll find, I'm gonna leave a little gap here because this is gonna be yellow and I don't want it to be all sort of brown. So I'm using a very dilute shade of, uh, shade of burnt umber, but to be honest with you, it's just any old mucky color that's sitting on my palette because the color, <laughs> when it's this dilute, it really doesn't matter um, what color you use. I'm gonna leave a little bit of a shape for my boat. Why am I not painting over my boat and put the boat on afterwards like I'm doing with the walls? It's because the boat is, there's a lot of white on the boat. So I wanna make sure I keep that beautiful pure white. So I'm building up my shapes. Now I've gotta leave that to dry because there's no point um, trying to work on top of it in a pen. That's not gonna work unless it's completely dry. So I'm just putting in the tide wall here. So I'm really just blocking out my shapes. And while I'm going to wait for that to dry a little bit, why not just, since we only have 25 minutes, why not throw down some clouds? Okay, so with your clouds, you can do two things. You can draw your clouds in pen, and I did for this original drawing, but this drawing goes back a little while now. And I prefer to draw clouds with, what do I do clouds with? I'm going to grab, do you know what? I'm going to grab a pencil, and sometimes I do it this way, and I'm going to make some random cloud shapes. Again, your clouds are going to move so fast. So even if you get them wrong, who's to say they're not going to take that shape two seconds later? And the top side of the cloud, I'm going to get, be speaking in broad generalizations. The top side of the cloud, especially as you go up into the top of the sky, the bit over your head, the top side is way fluffier and rounder than the bottom side. And this is much more marked the lower you go in the sky and the more you go close to the horizon. So I'm just going to pop on some nice little flattish clouds and you don't see very much at this at this moment. And then you can you can do what you like with the cloud lines you can use. You can you can rub them out when you're done and that's absolutely fine. Or you can leave them there. You probably won't see them very much. 
And um, one thing I'm going to tell you about the color, we'll get onto the color in a second. But one thing I'll tell you about the color is that your sky tends to be a lot richer in color. I mean, I'm telling you things, you've seen a million different skies, but I'm just going to point it out anyway. You tend to have a much richer color um, at the top of the sky than you do towards the horizon. It gets much more turquoisey. Well, look, it does in Ireland. <laughs> so I'm going to move my page through 90 degrees just so that I can get, do you know what actually I'm going to do? I'm going to use my other page to get a straight line of my horizon. Now I was given a fantastic, this is for the sea horizon. I was given a fantastic tip by a, an artist friend of mine. He's, he's just amazing. And he does an awful lot of sea scapes. And this, the tip I'm going to give you is, do I see it around here? No, I don't. So if you go, if you take a piece of washi tape and ru run it along the horizon, push it down well with your finger so that there's no water going to leak underneath it, you will be able to um, get that perfect straight horizon. And then mm -hmm. you can throw it on, throw it on. So I, think I, don't, I didn't even think of it beforehand. What a pity, because I'd love to show you how, how, how well it works. But the good news is if you forget your washi tape, which you probably will, because <laughs> you, often mm -hmm. you don't even know you're going to go, you're going to be sketching where you end up sketching. Um, then you can you can just stick it on at home stick the washi tape on a little bit above the horizon just a little bit make sure you put it on nice and horizontally and then you can just raise your your horizon a little bit in other words i often i want to say this before i do the next move i often make a very wobbly horizon it's got a lump in it it's rising <laughs> at one side or the other and it really offends the eye so when i get home I put the washi tape as close as possible to the horizon, but so that all the bumps and all the rises are going to be taken care of. And then when that washi tape is stuck well down, I go over the horizon a few times in a nice, rich, darker blue. And the good news is horizons tend to be super dark, bluey color um, just where they meet the sky. Again, they do in Ireland. See, I can get away with anything if I say that. Sure it is. <laughs> sure they do, Ro. Okay. So I'm going to pop on. I'm gonna That's pop a great tip. <laughs> I'm going to put on some clean water, which I know is hard to see. I have a little bit of blue in it, but that's no harm. Now I'm using my Rosemary & Co. Or 13 travel brush, which is a mixture of synthetic and natural. And the reason it's so useful as a as an all-around brush is because the synthetic gives you a good bit of spring, whereas the natural element gives you um, loads of ability to hold tons of water. But if I put clean water on around my clouds and go as close to the crinkles as you possibly can in the cloud, so that you, you're, because the water is only going to go where there's water, sorry, the blue is only going to go where there's water. So the, the blue is, the water is the vehicle for your, for your nice blue sky. So I am going to, I've mixed up some fallow blue here. Doesn't really matter. Do you know what? Here's the thing. I spent ages trying to find cerulean blue. So, you know, you have to have the sky blue color. No, you don't. It was the Portuguese guys who taught me that you don't have to uh, stick to a sort of a formal color for um, sky because they just use tons of different blues. Mm -hmm. And I figured that it's lovely and sunny in Portugal. So if they can do it, well, then it's, perfectly valid now if the reason i'm putting on that 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 wet at the beginning is because you will find that that way you won't end up with any brush strokes so it's a fantastic technique for skies now i've done way too rich of a blue beneath the cloud because as i was saying earlier it's actually usually a lot lighter um, and yeah. towards the bottom but you can get rid of that too at this stage now this is probably the only stage in the whole painting where you have to work super fast because uh, you, if you if you let anything dry and put on extra layers of paint or add, if you go, oh, do you know what? That looks a little bit, I don't know, I could have smoothed it out a little bit. And if you try to put more paint on, you're going to get a great big cauliflower, which I personally love the look of. Mm -hmm. But I know that people um, get freaked out when they get them. And I suppose <laughs> it's nice to have the choice. So cauliflower yes. occurs when you've decided, oh, I need to add a bit more color there. I'll just add some more. Any Once the paint has started to dry at all, you're going to adding any more layers of, of um, paint is going to create one of those. Next thing, I'm not going to smooth out all these, you know, bad bits, all these uneven bits. I like my sky to be lively. Now I've, I, I, I'm, this paper isn't, it does, 
here's me trying to explain myself, but it does tend to do a little bit of cauliflower in here. But if I that's that is the result of me having added an extra little bit of color when I should have probably left it alone. Once you put your first layer of paint down, if you if you jump in there and try to smooth it out, you will ruin your lovely texture. You will lose your lovely watercolor texture and you may as well be painting on cartridge paper. So you need to leave it alone and let it dry all by itself. And you will find the chances are it will um, it'll smooth out and flatten out by itself once it dries. Watercolor is amazing that way. Only experience and trial and error is going to convince you of that. But I can tell you right now that that is what's going to happen. So what about the um, the dark bits of the clouds? So I'm going to do the same thing with the clean water. Not too much, not too little. And just on the bottom parts of the clouds, I'm just going to pop some of this nice clean water. So this is less blue. You can barely see it. So just a little bit of, of, of the bottom part of the clouds. I wonder if I just see, look, I'm getting tempted to push the blue into the pinky <laughs> bits. But if I'm, I'm yeah, I'm gonna end up with cauliflowers there. Yeah, oh, that's okay. Yeah. I, I so, love that term. Is that a technical official watercolor term that I haven't heard yet? Or well, that's what people say. I don't like it. I prefer bloom because I think bloom is yeah, much more artistic pretty, yeah. and yeah. much prettier. Mm. But they look at me blankly when I say when I say bloom and they say, Are you do you mean a cauliflower? And I, <laughs> I, say, I say, yeah. So um, this is my palette. I have got this bluey gray color on it from purpley color from something else. And it's looking at it there, it happens to be perfect for the color I'm looking for to get that beautiful misty bottom part of the cloud. And because I put clean water on the bottom of the cloud, by dropping this little extra bit here, it'll just mist in nicely. And you can add a little bit, it doesn't matter about blooms here, it really doesn't matter. So. You can also, if you think it's too hard of an edge between the brown or the mucky color and the white, just blend it out with a little bit of a clean brush. And then if you if you feel when you come to the end of that, if you feel mm, my clouds look a lot more threatening than that, just do it again, except go a little mm. bit lower on your on your dark part. I'm going to do the same with the little flatter clouds. Just a little strip of water and a little strip of that nice purpley color. And again, the dark bits of the clouds are a little bit different towards, towards the horizon. And I'm gonna use, now this would normally be a little bit of turquoise, but I'm missing it at the moment in my, in my paint box. So I'm just gonna do a really thin strip just above the horizon of blue. Okay, and while all that's messing is going on, I think I, my, my pier is probably dry enough to start scribbling on top. Yep, it's fine. Um, yeah. Normally, sorry, did somebody say something? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were they yeah. just supportive totally. background noises from us? Oh, good, Ooh. good. Bring them on. Bring them on. Yay. <laughs> okay, so this is my foodie pen. I am absolutely wedded to my foodie pen. As you can see, it's got a 55 degree bent nib. So let me just get that into focus. There you go. Nice. Um, and I could not survive 15 minutes, I don't think, without, without this pen. Now, I didn't start using it until 2017. Until that point, I was using a platinum carbon pen. Um, and I, I, I find that the expressivity of the Fude pen is just brilliant. Um, and depending, as you probably know, but depending on the angle you hold it, you get a thicker mm -hmm. or thinner, a thinner nib. Now I'm just marching in, yeah. sorry, thicker or thinner line. You're I'm holding it upside in. down oh, to get that really thin line. So I'm using the thin line right now. So that's the reverse of the nib. And that's um, my little my little set of steps. And I'm going to give it a tiny bit of a wobble in the bottom. Just, just and you'll and it gets a little bit more kind of fadey and less um less defined as you go away. At this particular, as you go deeper into the sea, this is, I'm just going to throw on some seaweed. Now, seaweed is probably one of the things that I learned earliest when I moved out here because seaweed is everywhere and it's a glorious thing to, to learn to sketch with because the very nature of seaweed in a landscape is just so scribbly and it, it kind of gives you full permission to free up your hand and to get into a nice scribble mode. So possible it's possible mm -hmm. that the reason I'm such a scribbler is down to my training on the ground um, at all these many harbors around me so there is my little 
my shapes are beginning to just sort of come together. Another big pile of seaweed here, and I'm going to draw the top of the, the tide wall. And now for my little boat, just pick out these little lines. I absolutely love drawing the boats. Now, one of the problems with boats, once the water starts doing anything at all, other than completely, well, I'm going to say starts doing anything because the water is always either on the way out or on the way in. So um, it means that your boats are, unless they're totally pulled up onto the, onto the, the ground, they are going to twist and turn and bob. Um, so it's one of those things that you just have to be super fast with. So, yeah. Like gestural almost. Yeah, yeah. I, I do like a gestural line. Let me move my camera down a little bit so you can see a bit more. Okay. Oh, so. There now, isn't that a bit better? Mm -hmm. um, Fantastic. And remember with your watercolor, so there's all these bollards. With your watercolor, you can always go darker, but you can't go lighter. So always be conscious of your areas of light. Now I'm trying to sort of meet up with the line here. So I'm being quite cautious and I'm using the reverse of my nib. And this was supposed to be brown ink because I do like brown, but it's for some reason it's, it's quite dark. I'm just gonna put in that little bit of land on the other side. I suppose I'm pretty confident with it at the moment because I know that I got a nice horizontal line by running. I, what I did when I turned this piece of paper through 90 degrees, what I actually did was I um, I used a piece of paper, aligned it, my other piece of paper, lined it up at the edge. Sorry, hold on. Lined it up at the edge here. Mm -hmm. And that way I knew that the, the long edge was completely parallel. Mm. So there's loads of different things you can use. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sure all of us urban sketchers have used our phones as straight edge and <laughs> pressed the volume knobs and uh, because they make you make a mistake. <laughs> so there's a little bench there and I'm just drawing the shadow of the bench rather than the actual bench itself. Give me a time to check there, Ellie or, or Jenny, so that I just know how long. Um, you have about 10 minutes left. Oh, good. That's perfect. So there's all these little bollards lining up on the shore so these are for these are for um tying up the boats and it is this entire area is such a, a training ground for so many things it's a training ground for perspective it's a training ground for for drawing quickly for trying to get things in before the tide takes them away from you and skies of course and reflections and so on okay so I'm going to, before I do anything else, I'm just going to pop on some lines. I'm using my skinny side of my nib for the pointing between the rocks. Now, people will often wonder how many bricks and blocks do you show? Do you do the lot? Do you do not so many? I think the answer is you can't get away with doing none. And if you're trying to do them all, you will just make it look really labored. So mm -hmm. I, I tend to do like, like this, dum, 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 really, really fast. And then I just do that. And I try as accurately as possible. Mm -hmm. That's not very good. But I try as accurately as possible <laughs> to get the vertical lines of, of pointing right between um, the one above it. Yeah, just getting and the that pattern. Way. Yeah, so you kind of get your eye in. So I'll do it here if I can. And if, you're, if, you're, if you do manage to get those little vertical lines in, just direct, halfway beneath the one above it, and if you get them along the way, it, it, it can look kind of nice. Okay, so and I'm going to start darkening up those colors and hopefully I'm going to throw something into a look of stone. Now these, this pier was built in, I think 1840 or something like that. And it's amazing when I think about it, that, uh, that it's weathered to all the storms we have here around the West without, any any damage but the good news is as far as being a sketch is concerned um it means that those little lines of pointing are very um they're kind of they're kind of weathered and you can really you can be quite organic when you're drawing them and it's very pleasant it's very pleasant to draw them so i'm just picking out the sides that are in shade so mm -hmm. i'm being a bit exaggerated about this just for, I suppose, demonstration purposes. 
If you wanted to make the other side of the wall look sunny rather than just completely white, you can just work up a really, really um, dilute layer of yellow. Or, or it doesn't really matter what shade of yellow. I'm, I tend to be less particular about and uh, naming exact colors and more like um, I'll say things like yellow and uh, I won't say red so much because red is so is so uh, varied. But I'll say sort of a nice, clean, bright yellow. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that's kind of roughly um, roughly what you're doing. I'm just adding a little bit of Aquarius green. So I use the Roman Schmal brand of paints, just adding a little bit of Aquarius green to make the water slightly different color. And to get a little bit broken as the further away it gets from the item being reflected. So your reflections, let me just do a little bit of a small demo here at the side. So what will we give as an example? OK, let's give a nice little boat as an example. So there's your little boat. So close to the boat, you've got these nice little perfectly reflecting lines. The further away from the boat, the more it gets broken up. Same for the little wheelhouse, whatever it's called. That's a little bit further away, so it gets a little bit more broken up. So the further away you get from the boat or the object being reflected, the more the lines get broken up. Obviously, it's going to change according to the wind conditions. So usually the bit right next to the water is 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 like really really straight lined and then as i say the further away you get the more wobbly it gets um what else was going to say so you will have you will have a certain color for your for your item that's ca casting reflections and then that that color is usually a little bit altered it can be absolutely exactly the same in my experience, that doesn't happen very, very often. It's usually a little bit altered. So my ink is still wet. It's going to change the color, but I've just added a little bit of green to the color. Mm -hmm. And then you break up the lines. So we'll do the same thing here. You just break up the lines. So the lines of the outside get broken up and the middle bits get bro broken up as well. Um, and obviously the white, the white bit of the boat is going to stay white. So, um, so it's 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 a fascinating study to be painting reflections in water, which I do a lot. I do it a lot. Um, and I always enjoy it because it's something you can get your teeth into in terms of using your eyes and drawing what you see well. And um, there's something else I want to say. Oh, yeah. Really important. The reflection doesn't go further than the farthest most, most further most, further most out further out most you know what I'm trying to say yeah, Stick, yeah. the most sticky out bit so your reflection yeah. doesn't go past the most sticky out bit and that's the technical term I believe and um I'm learning you know so what? much new English words here uh -huh. <laughs> I think I might get a call from the tourist flowering. board <laughs> yeah you need um, that one what else was going to say so uh there was something about a mass I can't remember what it was um, OK, so basically another thing that's quite interesting, depending on the wind conditions and the and the, you, you can have a much, much longer reflection than the bit that's actually being reflected. I have no idea how the physics of that works. And I refused to believe it was possible until I actually saw it happen. And mm -hmm. then I had to I had to grudgingly accept that that is indeed what happens. Oh, I know what I was going to yeah. say. Sorry. Look what I did there. You, the reflection doesn't start until you've come to the you come to the counterpoint of the reflection if you know what I mean so that bit there this this has to be accounted for in the bottom on the bit that's reflected so one of the things I see it's such a common thing I don't know why people do it but they do say you've got a tree and it's you've drawn a nice tree so you from what I've just told you you, sh you know by now that that tree is exact mirrored exactly but I'll see this I'll see this and oh. I understand I understand why people do it because once you start drawing you can get very lost in mm -hmm. you can get it you're, I think it's a right brain thing that just kicks in and you sort of lose consciousness of what you're drawing but you it's it can be quite tiring to be to to sketch because you really have to concentrate and you have to focus because there's all these little little bits and pieces going on and you really have to you have to be on to them. So I'm just going to pop on a little bit of 
shade on the seawall. I'm sure mm -hmm. we're coming to the end of time, but never mind. Yeah, Maybe just done. a couple of minutes, a few minutes so, left. Brilliant. So, Roisin, we have a question in the chat. Liz yes. is asking what ink you are using, as it doesn't seem to bleed much when you. Oh, paint. very good question. So, this is my Diatramentis document ink. Oh, as you can see, it bleeds yes. on my fingers. It's all, my hands are always covered in ink. This is Diatramentis document ink. And um, Willa says the reflection thing is because we see the light reflection of the surface of the water, which is more of a view of the underside than someone facing it dead on. Oh, well, that's very that enlightening. Sense. Thank you, Willa. And the other one I use is Sketch Ink by Roaring Klingner. Um, and this, this is a wonderful ink because it has some really groovy colors. So I love this color. I never go without this, this, this shade in my pencil case. It's called Emma, and it really is the color that you see on the, on the front here. Um, I've started going back to my carbon ink for black work because the diatramentus, they're going to kill me now, but the, <laughs> um, the diatramentus black ink um, I have found my personal experience is that it can be a little bit cloggy. So uh, black can be hmm. a little bit tricky, I think, to get it to behave itself. Yeah. Just that little bit Carbon there. black is, it's such good ink. It's, it if you really want a black good. ink, it's the yeah. best. It's really good. So what I'm going to say to you here is that and I, I'm just waiting for things to dry so I can pop on my, my, uh, my C. But the darker, if you want a white to stand out, then deepen up. The color just around it and that's the same for 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 light for if you want shadows to look shadowy and if you want whites to look bright then you're going to darken up right around it hmm. so i'm just going to pop a little bit of paints gray in the, this is a burnt umber and paints gray mix so i'm just into the wet paint i'm just dropping little bits of dark and if it's wet enough it should just spread nicely and behave itself for me and not look too kind of unnatural now I'm going to use some burnt sienna and burnt umber mix just to get that orangey color for the seaweed. And I'm going to add in that little bit of greeny stuff here. And I'm just going to fill in the watery reflection and a little bit of this. And you should be starting to feel a little bit of reflection-y stuff. Okay, so we'll leave that to dry yeah. a little bit. Again, deeper, closer to the, closer to the, uh, the subject being reflected. Okay, so now I I'm think I think you can already see completely understand the scene. Like the Good. reflections work so well already. They're quick. And they're quick yeah, I've and always effective. been wondering because I only know your sketches from seeing them online. Mm -hmm. But your sketches always look to me like so luminous. Mm -hmm. Like like when it's sunny, it's incredibly sunny. And when yeah. it's yeah, just like how you deal with light and contrast light. just is so is so good. Well, that's, a, that's of... a very interesting um, observation, Jenny. And I will tell you, my sketch, I was saying to Ali before we before we start the class, my, my um, I, I always go through the oh, my God, my sketches look this sketch is looking disgusting stage. And that you have to just ignore it and remember that um, it's going to look good when you're done. And the reason it does that for me is because I am always so conscious of light and if there's no magic trick. It's simply a question of making sure. Just remember that without any light, there is no, no, without any dark, there is no light. Isn't that it? Without any um, dark, there is no light. So obviously nothing is brighter than the, than the white of my page. And I just let that shine by deepening up the colors right next to it, like right in there, I'm going right in close to that wall because I want it to shine out. Now, normally mm. I would probably, I would probably um, put some kind of a, a, a very light wash on top of it, but you will make any white stand out and glow by darkening up the area right next to it. So it's the borders between colors that are just so vital. And they are what transforms a flat sketch that can be really quite wishy-washy into something that actually feels, oh my God, that actually feels real. So huh. um, it's all too. about, it's, it's very, very technical in the sense that, in, this, in the true sense, it's just technique. It's just technique. There's no magic. It's just learning that technique and, becoming making it a habit and once it becomes a habit it becomes second nature and once it becomes second nature then you're free to start throwing your brush around and being really 
loose and suggestive and all that that good stuff that we all love um so i always my role as a teacher is always as a technician first and then because i can't really do your artistic sense that's you but all what i do is i clear the path i hope for all the little technical um little i suppose foibles there that's a nice one after all those fine words it's going to run right into my little wall but why not a little bit of a mm-hmm. color run is a beautiful thing at the yes. end of the day it's watercolor and we need to let the water do its thing i think there is a there is a very fine line between letting the watercolor be in control and you being in control and you you agree to meet in the middle and each express yourself the way you want to but it is a wonderful thing when you say okay watercolor i i trust you and i know what you want to do um and and we'll agree to come to a certain point and you do you and i do me and that can be a, a, a wonderful thing and and lately i've stopped trying to get rid of my little mistakes and and missteps at my brush and i just let them be um sometimes i regret it afterwards but more often than not i go that's really nice so it's good to just let things do their own thing mm-hmm. a pop of yellow for the for the life ring now look what i've done very badly i haven't shown the yellow ring in the in in the, in the water but uh what can i say i can't remember mm-hmm. doing it <laughs> could have done anything it's a long time yeah. ago no idea so you have to let things dry you have to wait a little bit um again as a plein air artist you will often find that the the page refuses to dry and you can look at that two ways you can go oh god i can't layer i can't do layering or you can say this page is the 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 horizon or whatever is going to bleed into my wet sky that hasn't dried yet and it's just going to tell the viewer that this was a really wet wintry day when i painted and it'll have yeah. that sense of i suppose reality which is i personally think it's hard to beat that just going to pop on the little mirror suggestion now as i say this pen is actually not the pen that i was i like my pen to be just a little bit scratchy so that i have the opportunity to do really really thin lines if i want to um i'll find my platinum carbon pen where did i put it um a platinum carb i have a platinum carbon pen here it is I have a platinum carbon pen that I've had since 2012. And while it still works fine, it is very scratchy. Here, here's one of them anyway. A dog ate one end of this. So. <laughs> oh my gosh, that happened to mine too. No Not way. A dog, but I just took it out of my bag and the back half was gone. Oh, no way. Did a dog eat it? I don't know. The backpack ate it. Yeah, my backpack eats a lot of things. But as long as it's not the business end, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. We are over time now. So let's get the last bits. That was a great little detail, actually. Like filling in that white area. Yes. Yes. Just it just tells you, oh, this is actually, you know, a a little bit of wall. So Mm -hmm. there's a few. And it's just it's a great thing to like. do, do that on a focus point. Like that's yeah. the area where you have the darkest darks and the lightest lights. And you now have the texture, the information about how this wall looks. Mm-hmm. So I think that really is where the viewer's eye is like gonna go mm-hmm. very nice. Yeah. And you only need to do a tiny little bit and the, the viewer's eye will fill in the rest. Yes. So true. I mean, I think that the brain wants to make sense of whatever it's looking at so when i come back to a drawing where i've done something really heartily wrong like i did a profile of my husband and he had two ears on the same side of his head and i didn't (laughs) even notice that until that's why i married him (laughs) no but i didn't even notice that until um i came back to do a redraw of it i was like what (laughs) so my my eye had only only you know it was like no 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 i don't see two ears i only see one ear so you know your brain will always try to make sense of of whatever it's looking at so that's a real advantage i think for for us as sketchers you can do quite a lot that and their brain will go oh yeah that looks really good you know but actually it's it's it doesn't really make that much sense if you start looking too closely mm-hmm. 
just going to, while you're chatting, I'm going to just chat, throw in a little bit of seaweed at the uh, water line, because again, that'll tell the viewer, oh, this is where the water ends, the water, um, the wall ends and the water starts. So it's a little bit damp, but it's okay. It's going on just about. Yeah, the seaweed is damp. So seaweed is damp. Seaweed is damp. Okay. Okay, thank you. This looks finished to me. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure.